Kyle here from allmediareviews.blogspot.com. Artist Review Renaissance. It might be two parts, it might not. These videos tend to go between 20 and 30 minutes. My apologies, I wish they could be shorter, but a lot of ground to cover. <laughs> anyway, this is a band that, um, yeah, it's they're not as well known as Yes or Genesis, or even the band that probably they get the closest comparisons to, who I do like, but I'm never, I've never spent a lot of time um, with a lot of their music is the Moody Blues. But if you're a fan of the Moody Blues, uh, sort of in the folk, psychedelic, you know, rock of sorts, very orchestral at points, Renaissance is a band that would appeal to you. The only one of the biggest differences they have, most of their music has a female singer. So, um, all right. And I, you know, claim to be like a super knowledgeable fanboy for them, and I am, but I'm not. I don't know their history, like, beginning to end, like, to the letter. So, and I do have some of the records that I really haven't spent a lot of time with. If I'm actually doing this right. I have, yeah. So, anyway, their, their origins actually do um, trace to, uh, oh man, I didn't think about that. I think I brought it to work. Anyway, their origins trace to the Yardbirds. Um, the end of the period of the Yardbirds, after I think Jimmy, I think the after Jimmy Page left and formed Led Zeppelin, the Yardbirds did exist. Uh, but I don't know the exact history. But Keith Ralph, if I'm not mistaken, now this is really moving well. Keith Ralph uh, and Jim McCarty. Well, anyway, their first album, with the help of Wikipedia. And it's just, we have, we're having some storms here in Minnesota this afternoon in Twin Cities. Uh, fortunately, where I am isn't getting the brunt of it, but we're still getting some of it. And it seems like my internet connection is going in and out, and my computer just is slow. But yeah, the self-titled album doesn't have the original, the singer that I always think of. But it, Keith Ralph, I think, was with the Yardbirds, and Jim McCarty may have. But those are the two main songwriters for this album and the early records that came out in 1970, I believe. Well. <laughs> and uh, the truth is, while I own this album, and I think I actually have it on CD, I've spent very little time listening to it. I know they were more blues-based. Naturally, they came from the Yardbirds. Uh, but they still included folk music. Um, but this first album, like from Genesis to Revelation, is an album that I haven't spent enough time to really, you know, elaborate that much on. But I just kind of know it's sort of based on the early sound. Um, yeah, it came out in 70. Like when I was doing those write-ups a couple years ago, I remember I was basically saying the same thing. That Renaissance, the name, holds a lot of weight for me. But unfortunately, that some of the early music... You know, I haven't spent as much time with, even though I bought it. You know, stuff isn't that expensive, and just, you know, time, and you're you're listening to something else. So that was in actually, I think that it wasn't seventy; it was sixty-nine. I should have known that. Uh, but I know it was sort of out of the ashes of the Yardbirds, you know, because Zeppelin formed in sixty-eight, I think. So, you know, it was they existed in some form, and some of the members maybe they were with the Jimmy Page Yardbirds. I don't remember, but um, they put out Illusion the, the, in seventy-one, two years later. And again, this is, they were doing a lot of instrumental work on at this period. Um, let's see if I can take a look at the, Keith Ralph was the guitarist, then um, Jane Ralph was the vocalist at this point, and Jim McCarty was the drummer. Uh, John Hawkins was keyboardist, and Louis Sanamo was the bassist. So, um, but again, the, you know, they were doing sort of the progressive stuff, but it was still kind of bluesy, but you just look at it. It has sort of an arty uh, element to it. I mean, of that time, I'm just looking here, though. It's interesting. The writing credits... The writing credits are, like, are kind of over the place because it does list Michael Dunford as a guitarist. Who, he is one of the ones I, I, I think of for Renaissance. Personnel on Mr. Pine. So maybe he was a guest. He hadn't actually joined the band, but he played um, guitar and he wrote at least... The song Mr. Pine, that was it. But um, And then they had Becky Thatcher actually write the lyrics to Pass Orbits of Dust, which she also developed a relationship with them writing a lot of their lyrics. That's why I know the name. But I think, you know, McCart Ralph and McCarty were the main 
people in this in the band at this point. Um, cool label, Illusion. I do actually have this on CD, so you know I've. <laughs> It's been sitting there, and I just need to get around to listening to it. I don't listen to CDs that much just because it's not as convenient at work. I'll put on digital music. Um, so, all right, so that was 71. So here, they're, they're just, it, like a lot of bands, it seemed like that really kind of found their, their way, and their kind of, like, Sticks would be another example, or um, oh, there's some other ones. Super Tramp. They, they, they didn't really find this sort of, their niche until later, but they did a, they put out a bunch of records. Even Crimson after uh, Wake Up Poseidon sort of was kind of finding what they were going to do next. But they put out Prologue in 72, and that to me was sort of, that was like their, uh, um, what's it called? The, <laughs> thinking of uh, Trespass kind of for Genesis. It was sort of, they had more personnel change. John Tout joined, uh, he was the keyboardist, and he did some vocals, like harmonies. And Annie Haslam did, that was her first album. Although, I gotta look at the set list, and I thought I actually had a copy of this on vinyl. I have it on CD, I'm pretty sure. But she actually played some percussion too. John Camp also joined, so you, two, the two Johns, and I don't think either of them um, had actually, um, Dunford was still doing arrangements, but I guess he wasn't a, an extensive performer on this record. Rob Hendry played some guitar. So, I mean, they had some lineup changes still at this point. And this was in 72, June, July, when they recorded it. Recorded it in 72. But the thing about Prologue is the title track is great, but it's all instrumental, other than the fact you have Annie doing these chants and the other members doing some chants. There's a song called Kiev that I, I, I have grown to like a bit just from hearing the live versions of it. But, um, you know, among the first three records, again, I know this one the best. But I still don't know it that well. So, you know, I'm sort of guilty of sort of, you know, not being as, as versed in the origins of this band. But so, but Annie, Annie and the two Johns had joined. John Camp and John Todd, I always think of. And uh, John, uh, Michael Dunford, who was a longtime member, got a little, at least was still involved. But, okay, so that was in 72. Then 73, the first album <clears throat> where I, I kind of see as their classic lineup. So if, 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 Illusion was, <laughs> if Illusion was like Trespass, this was like um, Nursery Crime. And this is uh, Ashes Are Burning. This is a great record. I, I have, when I first got into Renaissance, I got a couple of compilations and it featured a number of songs from this record. So you can see it's a gatefold, although this, the quality of this is kind of questionable. I don't remember if I bought this new. It seems like it's barely been touched. But at the same time, I don't know why a record case would be quite that flimsy. No, this is a Harvest, so this is a... It may not be an original pressing, but it's not a new pressing. I don't believe it is. And it's stuck in the case, which is also not a... I think I'm holding on to like part of the plastic or something. There we go. So I don't think it's... Yeah, no, there's a sticker that shows it new, just the, the tape. But the title track to Ashes of Burning is great. I mean... What I guess, at Renaissance, for those, you know, I was mentioning the Moody Blues with the female singer, a lot of falsetto vocals. She had like a five, five and a half octave range, Annie. But they really had a big influence of folk music, of classical music, symphonic music, and even pop music to a point. But the other thing about it is they don't feature a lot of electric guitar. I look at them almost like the band Weather Report, the fusion act, which they never had electric guitar with that band. They just had Jaco Pistorius playing these you know, guitar-like bass lines and playing chords, but but they featured a lot of bass lines, a lot of piano, so it kind of compensated. But this album features Ashes Are Burning, and also, oh, my bad, the title track, but the rest of the track list. For some reason, I think I had another copy of this that just had the, didn't have a gatefold, but Can You Understand, Let It Grow, On The Frontier, all just sort of very melodic, very dreamy. Um, I want to put this away before I... I damaged it more than it might already be just from the, uh, the whatever was sticking there. Um, though all those songs have very good melodies and harmonies. They feature harmony vocals. Um, I would say yeah, a lot of the music on it. Uh, you think of like Trespass from Genesis. That that it shares a lot in common with that, but just with more with female vocals and with, with a maybe more symphonic element. But then Carpet of the Sun, At the Harbor, I mean, this, this record is without a track I don't like. 
Ashes Are Burning is the best piece. It's an epic. And the bass line is just driving and just kind of the, the composition, the way it flows and builds. So, and, and you know, some of it's sort of hippie-ish, I guess, but in a good way. It doesn't seem to lose me. It's not like they sound like they're on drugs. So it just sounds very um, sort of it, uplifting or just, although there's a gothic element to it, but uh, almost spiritually uplifting. And, and um, so that was 73. That was toward the end of 73. I don't know. But then the next year they released Turn of the Cards, the second album with the quote-unquote classic lineup. And like uh, Ashes Are Burning, it's pretty much a tr an album that I don't, I pretty much like every track on it. I, I guess I would lean toward Ashes Are Burning between the two, but songs like Black Flame, it's, that's kind of gothic, but it, it has a, like, it almost features like, I think it's oboe. Um, some great oboe harmonies. Um, Mother Russia, that's very epic, almost gothic and dark to a point. Very kind of methodical, but very symphonic. Um, let's see here. I'm just showing the actual record itself. This is from um, Sire. I don't know, again, first pressing. It, it might be. The thing with Renaissance is while they had a, a, a small level of popularity, you don't. I don't struggle to find their albums, which is weird. Um, so this might be a first pressing. Running Hard, I Think of You. The things I don't understand. Running hard is is excellent. Um, it's kind of like a poem, but it, it's like a narrative almost, like a you know. I, don't know. I could read through the lyrics. Why they get the name Turn of the Cards, I'm not sure, but um, you know, Running Hard, Mother Russia. It has it has some songs that maybe involve sort of a card game, but I you know I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the origin behind the the actual. Um, album title in this case. I think it's a cool, uh, it's a good album title, but um, you could have called this album, you know, you know, Tales of Imagination, or that would sound like a, uh, the Alan Parsons Project. You could have called it something else, but um, anyway. So then that was 74, in what part of 74? The next record, which after listening to all the records, I guess I, I like all of them a lot, almost all equally, but this is probably the record I, I look at as their their masterpiece, their, their, their peak, their best work. Um, and I actually do, this is the one example, and I paid half price for this, I think, at Half Price Books, I got it on a sale, an original master recording of songs from Sherazade or Sherazade. I think it's Sherazade. I think most people say it's Sherazade, but... Classical composer. See, I mentioned the whole classical thing on with Renaissance's music. Yeah, you can really tell this has been preserved, but it has, well, one of my favorite tracks, my first favorite, like the track that kind of got me into them, A Trip to the Fair. A trip to the Fair. Great use of xylophone on that track, the story, the narrative. I have this, I get this kind of image of like being at the fair, it's sort of, it's almost like a Twilight Zone story. You know, the, the lyrics, I wish that this trip to the fair had never begun, but Annie's sort of um, impassioned, sort of climactic vocals that come out on that, on that song. It's very um, fable-like, you know, almost in a way. It's not maybe quite as based on sort of, you know, science fiction or something, but in a way it's like, this, she's, this, it's a story about someone who goes to the fair, or is supposed to go to the fair, wants to go to the fair, goes to the fair, and then it's like completely deserted. I think of that Twilight Zone episode like that where no, one, no one's left on the planet. But um, then, he, then this person has all these people like, it's like they're hiding and laughing at them and stuff like that. It kind of does speak to sort of the practical joke kind of thing when you're a kid. Uh, you know, if, if you know, you, this whole thing that had happened, you know, you thought your friends were really your friends, but they really weren't, or I don't know, they thought it would be funny and it wasn't. It, it's, it's kind of rebellious in some ways. I kind of look at it, but the other tracks on this this record, that's just one of them. That's it's like 12 minutes. It just it just is, it's awesome. It's probably my favorite song they ever did. But Vultures Fly High, that's kind of a poppy single. A lot of soaring any vocals on that one, um, and and harmonies. Ocean Gypsy, that's a dreamy track. Talking about um, like a gypsy or some woman who like a ghost in the ocean. Um, but then the second side, Sweet, is when I first heard this album, I'd heard Trip to the Fair and Vultures Fly High and Ocean Gypsy, all those songs on the compilations, but that second side is is very good. It's just, it's a classic prog epic. It's It's got <laughs> Fanfare, The Betrayal, The Sultan, Love Theme, Young Prince and, Prince and Princess, 
uh, sold by Sherazad, the festival preparations, Fugi for Sultan, the festival, and finale. It's like 20 minutes or 20, whatever it is. And it works. It's another one of these cases of a, and it's very symphonic, very orchestral, very uh, classical, but also almost operatic. It's very story-based. This whole record's very story-based. It's a little bit like Russia's Hemispheres or 2112 or, oh, I don't know. I mean, I guess the whole record isn't one cohesive story, but it's a bunch of different stories. In fact, that compilation that they, uh, which might be referencing Shakespeare, and this is another thing I didn't show that the uh, Mobile Fidelity, of course, came with, but, um, you know, the, oh, and then it's got actually an insert and everything. I, I hadn't opened this up until now, of the band, Annie and John Tout and John Camp and Michael Dunford. Has a list of all the uh, mobile, original master Mobile Fidelities, which, Dealey Dan's Asia, a lot of good breakfast in America with Super Tramp, Foreigner, Double Vision, The Doors, The Doors. Anyway, um, I have a standard version, of course. I didn't, you know, I didn't find that right away. But um, what was I getting on about? <laughs> about the uh, the uh, the concept? I forget now. <laughs> it's a concept album, but not like one full concept. Um, there's a bunch of oh, the compilations. The compilations were titled Tales of One Thousand One Nights. Volume 1 and one, 2, you know, so, uh, which I'm not sure if that's a Shakespeare reference or not. I think it is, but, um, but yeah, this is my other standard copy, which um, also features, it features that same sheet, I guess, so with the lyrics, it's green. But yeah, I guess, I'm not sure if you were never heard Renaissance, if this is the way, the way to go. I might lean toward um, Ashes Are Burning first. Just because this is a little more extensive. You know, it's like listening to Tales from Top of Africa Oceans, or even like if you listen to Supper's Ready before you heard any other Genesis, it might be a little too much to, to take in first. So, all right, they released the live album, which I guess even though I long, love songs for Sherazade, I kind of consider that the, the, uh, their best work. This would probably be my favorite record in terms of just because it covers... Um, if I'm not mistaken, Sherazad, it's got Prologue, Ocean Zipsy, Can You Understand, Carpet of the Sun, uh, Running Hard, Mother, yeah, it has the Sherazad on it, and that's the reason, that's the biggest, and Ashes are burning, but a lot of great pictures, you know. thing about Renaissance and Annie Haslam, specifically, they're British, but she actually lives here now, they, um, they were one of the first bands that actually had a female front, you know, person, singer, that kind of thing, doing this kind of music, which was really... For me personally, it was nice to see because it seemed like, you know, <laughs> the the interest and the ability to find, you know, women that did this kind of music was so rare and even find women who liked it. But if you had some women doing it, um, obviously it would help. But, yeah, this was considered, this was recorded at Carnegie Hall, of all places, you know. They had their classical influences. They did Sherazad. They had Sherazad and um, one other composer that I'm, I'm basing on. I think they actually covered, and they play live sometimes, parts that they'd reference um, it wasn't Bach or Beethoven, it was uh, a slightly more obscure one. But anyway, so that was 75 when Sherazad came out, and then the live at Carnegie Hall album was 76, I think. Was it? Well, let's see, they don't list the live albums in order. Yeah, it was. So then, 77, they released Novella, you know. And while it was hard to, to you know, follow up Sherazad, of course, because I think it was their most successful record at the time, this is still a very good album, and I think I consider this, well, I don't consider it the last, but, you know, like the, like Led Zeppelin, their records just kind of go from record to record, and there's just a lot of quality, and not very, it's got the song Can You Hear Me, The Sisters, Sisters I'm Not As Familiar, Midas Man's, kind of a good, catchy, poppy, kind of melodic piece, um, Touching Once in Captive Heart are, are I'm less, I have less memory about, but I, I, from this record, I remember thinking, well, this is one of their weaker records, and it, was, it wasn't a uh, novella. Um, and this, the danger with some of these jackets. But yeah, interesting artwork. So, you know, they were just, they were prolific. They're releasing like an album a year or two, almost every year. And the, the quality didn't seem to really um, go down, you know, to me. Um, so then I think the, the next record was um, 70 and 78, a song for all seasons. And 
I guess I would say that this is maybe, this might be the last really good album they put out to me, uh, at least from this period. And the, the title track from Song from All Seasons, I remember getting the second Tales of 1001 Nights compilation, and I really loved that song. Um, in fact, I could <laughs> read in the lyrics, um, talking about the seasons. Uh, east and West, okay, man has North, South, East and West, man has music, man has North, South, man makes music, song for, yeah, it was, it, you know, it was sort of a, from a little standpoint, talking about the seasons of the calendar year, um, you know, Nanny does a lot of good falsettos, I mean, every album, there's like, multiple moments where he does she does these falsettos that are just untouchable to me that there isn't a singer who sounds who can really sing that way um that well and that fits this kind of music the only thing is that becky thatcher wrote all the lyrics i wish she had written the lyrics because you know but if the song ended up better because she did that made that makes the most sense still um but this also features songs like northern light which was kind of a pop a minor pop hit uh, a lot of like falsetto vocal harmonies. It's it's a catchy tune. It got a little bit of radio play. I remember. Um, the first side, I think it's the first side. The sire copy. Day of the Dreamer, closer than yesterday, and kindness at the end. Our song that was written by John Camp. Um, you know, and again, I haven't listened to this record in in a number of years, but um, you know, the strength of the title track in Northern Lights. This record. You know, in that, that period of time, the writing just was very consistent to me. You know, I, I would, I mean, I like those individual songs, but, you know, listening to the whole record still lent, lent it to, to happen. So, all right, just to move on quickly, the next record they released, that was 78, the, toward the end of 77, early 78 when they recorded it, was called Azure de Or, and that record is not one that I'm, um, you know, the Winter Tree is the one track that I remember hearing on the compilations, and it was clearly to me a step down. And it, it was, the band, like a lot of the bands from that period, the punk scene and and disco and stuff, was kind of killing their interest. And I think creatively, maybe they had run their course to a point. I mean, they had whatever four or five, six records that were just hitting almost all on all cylinders. Um, I do have that on CD. I thought I had it in vinyl, but maybe I do not. I can't find my copy. Um, so. Slight step down on Azure de Or in 2000, or 2000, in 1978. Um, but, you know, it's still Renaissance. I, you know, I think the lineup may have started to change at this point as well. Anyway, okay, so they put out, the next record was Camera, Camera, I think it was. Was it? Yeah, it's in 81. And I don't think I've even ever heard that record. It says I have it digitally on writing music, but that record... I can't say a ton about that. that was 81. I, th I just remember the lineup was changing. Annie was still with them, but I don't know if both the Johns were still with them or... I think Dunford stayed along, because he, he's been like the one... He's like the Chris Squire of this band. He's been around the longest. Um, yes, so the next album they released was the next year. It's called um, Timeline, and I bought this. I, I got it for, well, 5 30 I don't think I paid that much for it. Maybe not a sale. But this does have... Annie Haslam, John Camp, and so the three of them, they're basically a trio. They were sort of becoming Genesis in a way. But this came out in um, 83. And I think this is the album, either this one or the previous one, that they tried to go and do punk. Punk and New Wave. But, you know, they did a cover of Electric Avenue, maybe. Anyway, I have it. I've never even listened to it, actually. So, like the early records, you know... I just, I, I've known the reviews and the ratings aren't that high for it, but, you know, I mean, if I ever get the chance to end up listening to this more, going onto YouTube and just listening and streaming it, or it's on Spotify or something, not on vinyl at the point I can use my vinyl, maybe my opinion would change. I mean, Drama from Yes is a good example of that. <laughs> I hadn't heard it in the moment that I heard it. Uh, but as a Renaissance fan, um, Annie's solo career... This album, I actually bought, but I haven't gotten around to listening to either. I only paid only two bucks. This came out, I think, in the 80s. It's called... Uh, I, I looked, I saw it earlier. Maybe it's a self-titled. Um, I actually bought one of her CDs that she did some classical or opera music, too. That was one of the first things I bought, because after hearing her do covers of Yes and Genesis songs, Ripples and um, 
uh, turn of the century. But this album came out in the mid '70s. I think it was the same, like right after Sherazad, Annie in Wonderland. This is considered, you know, by a lot of people as just as good as a lot of the Renaissance records. I mean, obviously she features, she's featured even more on this. And I think she did some of the writing in this, but there's like a Middle Eastern element to some of the songs. Um, obviously, it's a reference to uh, Alice in Wonderland, but yeah, it's on the same label even. Um, but yeah, I mean, I rate this, I think I gave it like three and a half or four stars. Um, I'm trying to remember the piece. The, the, the Middle Eastern piece was the one that stuck out the most to me. Hunico, maybe? I'm not sure, but... Um, and John Camp actually may, wrote the intralease If I Were Made of Music, so... You know, it's kind of getting some of the members to do other things. Nature Boy might be, because it's written by a boss. It's like a... I don't know. I, I just, uh, you know, it, it, I didn't know what to expect. I read a lot of glowing reviews of this album, and I would put this on par with some of their... Maybe not quite on par, but pretty close to some of the, the records from the uh, the mid-70s, that peak period. Um, following up, just to close this out, um, they did... They had did... They had did... They have done some reunions... In the last like 30 some odd years um let's see here but as far as studio they did tuscany in 2000 and grandine el vento in 2013 which i own and bought and was on my end of your list it's a good record uh michael dunford unfortunately passed away it was crowdfunded he passed away like before it even came out they recorded it with him um i thought and then they had the ep the mystic and the muse which actually i think featured a couple songs that ended up on grandine el vento in 2010 that was yes the myth, the title track, but it was, yeah, very, kind of, it harkened back to some of the 70s stuff with modern production, uh, great vocals from Annie. Annie's voice kind of had gone, and it just, she, she was doing a lot of painting, she wasn't able, able to sing in the 90s, uh, at periods at least, so, but yeah, that's uh, the spin on Renaissance, um, well, like I said, I'm not, like, versed in every one of their records, even though some of the ones I own, um, their, their peak period that, you know, early to late 70s, they, they they match up with the Zeppelin catalog or some of the other catalogs where every record's like four stars to me. There's so many good songs in every record. So if you've never heard them, like I said, Ashes Are Burning would be a, a, an excellent place to start. Um, check out Annie's voice. Maybe not everyone loves her voice, but she's got this very angelic voice that if you like it at all, you'll probably be won over. So thank you for watching. Please comment, subscribe, and, and like this if you, if you want. And we'll see you next time.